Hi. I decided to look into the history of a short street in Hornsey called Ferriston Road and to find out some stories of its former occupants. Uh, in this video I'm going to talk about what I found and reveal in which house lived the inventor, the organist, the person who won damages from the Hornsey Journal, the Irish Earl, the drunkard, the fraudster and several others including the poltergeist. As you know, a poltergeist is a supernatural phenomenon. And uh, that's all I'm, oh, what's that? That's very spooky. Well, anyway, I wrote about some of these stories in issue 61 of the Hornsey Historical Society Bulletin, but COVID-19 lockdown happened the very moment it was published. And um, anyway, the Hornsey Historical Society has that. As part of my research, I also wanted to see if I could find out how the street got its name. Um, Ferriston Road was built in the mid 1890s on Glebe land, which is land owned by the church and used to support a parish priest. Um, on this 1873 map, the red rectangle there shows where the road will later appear. To the north is the old St Mary's Church and, and leading south from that is Church Path, which became Glebe Road later on. And if you walk walk south up to the top of Glebe Road today and then keep going on in a straight line uh, you would come you'd be walking down the remains of Church Path which comes out next to the Hope and Anchor pub in Tottenham Lane. So I'm going to superimpose the 1894 map <clears throat> and here we are 22 years later and Ferriston Road has appeared but with no houses in it yet. They were built between 1894 and 1896. The builder was William Bysouth, who by 1900 lived in Mount Pleasant Road, Tottenham, in a house which he decided to call Ferriston House. But in the corner of Church Lane and Tottenham Lane, there's a building called Ferriston Lodge, which was already there, and from which Ferriston Road almost certainly took its name. But how did Ferriston Lodge get its name? Well, I started looking at surnames and um, I found a few people with names which look similar, but not very many. And, and the number of people with the surname Ferristone, spelt our way, was actually none at all. The name Firestone seems to have been around a lot longer. The name was all over the UK by the mid 19th century. And there's a German version, Feuerstein, and there's one that's a mixture. <clears throat> anyway, it looks like all the surname variants have evolved from Firestone or Feuerstein. Next I, look, next I looked at places and there's a district called Ferriston in Banbury in the Midlands and there's a Ferriston Road spelled the same as ours 40 miles away from Banbury in Wellingborough. Then I looked at old businesses. There was a the Ferriston Cycle Company which was actually located on that corner where Ferriston Lodge stood but later in time. And Ferriston Press, I don't know how that company got its name, but it published a few books, one of which was the trial of, Trials of Oscar Wilde, the first complete account of the trials, which later became the basis for the 1960 film starring Peter Finch. But this didn't help me understand how Ferriston Lodge had got its name. So in my article for Historical Society Bulletin, I, I, I concluded that Ferriston was probably derived from a place name or was a version of someone's surname. But since then I've discovered something else. Um, back on this 1894 map you can see that the land between Church Lane, Tottenham Lane and Gisborne Road was called Lister Park. That's because it was previously owned by Thomas, Thomas, <laughs> Thomas Marsh Lister and he was the man who built Ferriston Lodge. And it seems that back in 1853 he'd married Caroline Theresa de Fair. D-E-F-E-R-R-E. -E -E. I now think that his wife's family name possibly had something to do with the naming of Ferriston Lodge, after which our road is named. Forward to 1920 and it's now a fully built up area. Uh, Ferriston Road, it's a short road with a long name, so there wasn't enough space to name it on this Ordnance Survey map. Rumour has it there was one edition of the London A to Z map which completely omitted the road name from the index. Add to all that the fact that someone decided to number the road like this and it's actually a wonder that the residents get anything delivered to the correct address. At this point let me briefly introduce myself. So this picture of me taking a drink and I'll do the same. 
was taken not long after I moved into Ferriston Road in the winter of 1979. And here I'm trying to perfect the look of a tortured musician. Um, I've lived here ever since, nearly 42 years now. Uh, my music career didn't work out. However, my wife Tina and I both sing with the great local choir Crouch End Festival Chorus. And this is a sort of concert we did at the O2 a few years ago with the Italian tenor Andrea Bocelli. Tina has also done a considerable amount of research for this and a number of the stories you're about to hear were discovered by her. We're not historians by the way, we're amateur genealogists with a, an interest in local history. So now let's move on to the first of our historical characters. The Worried Railway Shunter. This letter was in the Daily Mirror during wartime. It features a picture of Mr H.L. Brown of Ferriston Road who has written to the paper about blackouts, which is when the lights had to be turned off so that enemy planes couldn't see where to drop their, their bombs. And Mr. Brown of Ferriston Road suggests in his letter that it would be dangerous to turn, turn the lights off in a railway shunting yard. Uh, the mirror agrees that shunting is a risky job already, but points, that, points out that normal lighting would make it even riskier, ending its reply with the words, so where do we all go from there? Now I actually thought these letters were made up, but this person definitely existed. His name was Hubert. And in 1939, he worked at Finsbury, si Finsbury Park Sidings. And in that year, he also lived at number eight. Next, we have the inseparable Scottish sisters. Now this is from the 1901 census and it shows these two sisters, Elizabeth Forrester and Barbara McKee living in Ferriston Road. Their ages are given as 48 and 46, but they must have lost count or something because other records show they're actually at least two years older than that. Elizabeth is widowed. Uh, her husband, James, had been the eldest son of a wealthy Glaswegian sugar merchant. In 1901, they seem to own this Ferriston Road house and are letting out rooms to D. Watson and W.C. Broadbridge. Looking further back in time, it seems that the sisters lived in the same house throughout their lives, including throughout Elizabeth's marriage to James. Barbara is always there with them, even though the addresses change. And in 1901, these sisters lived at number two. Now, the Irish Earl, or was he? <clears throat> this is the headline which appeared in 1929, and this is the wonderful subheading. In that year, 1929, the Earl of Egmont died. He'd had no children and the earldom devolved onto Fred Percival, a descendant of Pencer, Spencer Percival, the British Prime Minister who was murdered in 1812. Fred was presumed to be the rightful heir. He was a Canadian rancher and was all set to inherit some very nice chunks of Hampshire, Berkshire and Surrey until James William Percival of Ferriston Road also put in a claim. James was a baker in his late 60s who claimed to have been born in Australia, the son of a certain Augustus George Percival and his first wife Emma. If that was true, the Ferriston Road baker James was the rightful heir to the Egmont estate. So was it true? Well, here's a, a family tree with James there in the middle. <clears throat> um, the rules of inheritance are pretty complicated, but everyone agreed that the dotted line is what James needed to prove, that he's the eldest surviving son of Augustus George Percival at top left. If he can prove that link, he's won and is the Earl of Egmont, a wealthy landowner. This is a census record from 1911. James's family were at that time living in Rectory Road, Hornsey, not Ferriston Road. This census was filled out and signed by Emma Percival, James's wife. She's put herself at the top of the list, followed, the rest, followed by the rest of the family, and James appears last. But they have a son, Augustus, and this looks good because remember, Augustus is also the name of the man James needs to prove is his father. So young Augustus could very well have been named after his granddad. And James's birthplace on this is shown as Queensland, Australia, which is the right place too. Going back a bit further to 1881, and I'm very sorry about the poor quality of this image. Here he is age 17 in Clapham with the correct Augustus George Percival. Um, take my word for it, uh, that's him on the top line. The next line is Augustus's wife, his second wife. And the third line is our man, James Percival. But it says adopted son. 
And that's a problem because the law said that to inherit the Egmont estate, he had to be a son, not an adopted son. James argued in court that his parents had separated before his birth, but that his mother had later handed him over to his father, Augustus. Then after his mother had died, he said, his father had remarried and the family came to England. He could have been telling the truth, but as he couldn't produce evidence of his birth, such as a birth certificate, I'm sad to say James lost his case. So where did the Irish Earl live? Well, unfortunately, the Irish Earl was called Fred and he lived in Canada. Uh, but James William Percival lived at number four, or at least his son did. Strangely, the records show that in 1929, James was actually living nearby at 18 Birkbeck Road with his wife and two youngest children. But the newspaper article definitely said Ferriston Road. According to the electoral register, that's where his son Augustus was. So it was apparently the young Augustus who took the initiative and pursued this case through the courts on behalf of his dad. One last twist, if young, if young Augustus had been successful, he, he, might not have, he might not have inherited the estate from himself because his dad, James, had actually been married before to someone else called Ada and had had several children with her. Um, divorce records for that one have never turned up strangely, but James managed to marry Augustus's mum later using the name James Offley. Very curious. The inventor. This is a newspaper clipping from 1900 showing that along with someone called GM Reed, WH Knight of Ferriston Road patented stopping pipes, which I'd originally thought was something to do with car braking systems. And that's what I wrote in the Historical Society Bulletin. But Tina has since pointed out it's much more likely to be something to do with drainage because William H. Knight was a curator at a museum of hygiene and sanitation called the Parks Museum. Is the main hall of that museum as it was. So his invention, popping, popping stipes, stopping pipes, could have been for creating temporary valves in pipes in order to do repairs, possibly. <clears throat> in 1911, he was living in Ferriston Road with his wife, Susanna, and their two children, Rose and Elton, at number 12. The person who won damages from the Horsey Journal and two other local papers was called Ethel Campbell, born Ethel Kroger. Now, these dates are pretty important. Ethel married pawnbroker Andrew Campbell in Holy Innocence Church in 1907. They had three children, Geoffrey born in 1909 and twin girls, Betty and Joan born in 1915. Ethel petitioned for divorce in January 1925, but most importantly, they'd been married back in the spring of 1907 and it confirms this here but the three three local papers including the Hornsey Journal when reporting about her divorce from Andrew had incorrectly given the year of their marriage as 1917 instead of 1907. This cast doubt on the legitimacy of their children. The three papers all ran the same story and had to cough up 200 pounds each in compensation for damage to her reputation. So where in Ferriston Road did she live? Well, the newspaper articles about the case mention that she is off Ferriston Road, but I couldn't find any record of that at all. So it seems she may not have been here very long. Perhaps it was just a temporary accommodation while she went through her divorce. George Frederick Brockless lived in Ferriston Road in the 1920s. He was an organist and choir master at Hornsey Parish Church from 1920 to 1928. <clears throat> and this is the church. This picture was taken at the junction of Church Lane and Hornsey High Street. And if you look to the right of the picture, you might be able to see a church tower hiding behind the trees, which is older, but which still stands today. The big church taking up most of the picture was built in 1889 and was demolished in 1969 and St Mary's Infant School was built on that site. George was the music man in that big Victorian church. These are some of the rave reviews of George Brockless's piano performances from an earlier time when he was between the ages of 16 and 22 before he came to London. 
And this is later in 1932 at the Pageant of Essex, which was a musical extravaganza and a celebration of Essex history, combined with fundraising for a hospital. And it shows George Brockless receiving a gold watch from Lady Gwendolyn Colvin on behalf of the choir and orchestra. George is married to Marion Hargreaves, that's her on the right in the light clothes, holding a round box. And these lovely words are from an email I received from George's grandson, who mentions Brockless's musical qualifications and that he lived in Ferriston Road for 10 years. As you can see, he went on to become the musical director at Westminster Central Hall and he edited the 1933 Methodist hymn book. Though he loved playing the organ, it was choral music that was his main passion. George Brockless wrote some hymns too. This one's called Cradled in a Manger Meanly and Tina and I have sung this with friends and very nice it is too. So where did he live? George Brockless, the organist, choir master, choral enthusiast, lived at number 11. Right, the fraudster. Now, these articles from June and July 1906 detail the case against Henry Jonas, Henry Jonas off Ferriston Road, and someone else called Mark Young. It was about the shares they sold in the American Mining, Milling and Smelting Company. All these articles say that Henry was 64 or 65 years old. A few things to note about this company, they were selling shares in, um, it was old and established, it owned mines across several US states. It had recently become interested in Texas and California oil lands. It made net profits of 5.5 million pounds over nine years. And you've guessed it, it didn't exist. I won't go into it too much because the whole case is freely available online. Just search for Henry Jonas on this Proceedings of the Old Bailey website. Just to say though that our man Henry Jonas began his testimony with the words, I am 70 years of age, I believe, my next birthday. It was a mistake to say 65. In 1899, I was living at Plymouth. I had known Young and his family for some years. In 1899, I think was the first occasion he spoke to me of the American company. In other words, he claimed that he'd be taken in by the other man, Mark Young. Uh, the verdict though was they both found guilty. The, the jury thought that maybe Henry Jonas was taken in at first, but by the end of it all, he must have known that the company was bogus. Mark Young got 10 years in prison. Henry Jonas of Ferriston Road got 18 months hard labor. Yes, in 1906, hard labor was still a sentence you could be given, even if you were nearly 70 years old. And this fraudster lived at number 11 again. Okay, the drunkard. Now, this short 1904 article is about Teresa Baker of Ferriston Road being drunk in Turnpike Lane. Um, perhaps she was the first one, I don't know. She's certainly not the last. And this is 17, seven, sorry, seven years later, news of the separation of Teresa from her husband, Henry, on the grounds of her still getting drunk. Teresa, Teresa's husband, um, Henry John Baker, was another organist and professor of music and may well have known George Brockless, but they didn't live in Ferriston Road at the same time. This is the 1911 census, which was taken one month after that newspaper article about the separation order. And you can see she's already gone. And uh, against Henry's name there, it says married, separated. Or actually, separé. In case you've got a small screen, there you go. Separé. Um, Teresa's 84-year-old mum, Anne Palmer, is still living there, though, which may have, may have been a bit, bit awkward. Who knows? Anyway, I know what musicians can be like, so who knows? Perhaps it was Teresa's husband, Henry, who was driving her to drink, and hopefully things got better for her after they were uh, separate. Anyway, Teresa Mary Baker, who liked to drink, lived at number seven. So there you go. Right, now, the widow of the man who changed the man who changed Hornsey. First, the man who changed Hornsey. He's architect John Farrer, who designed over 1800 shops and houses in Hornsey, including the three compasses, which is seen on the front cover of this great book about him called John Farrer, the man who changed Hornsey. Now, when John Farrer first came to London from Cumbria in 1865, he became articled to James Wesley Reed, an established architect and surveyor. 
John Farrow learned from James. In fact, according to the book, this apprenticeship with James provided a wide range of experience in and depth of knowledge of designing a variety of buildings and supervising their erection. James Wesley Reed is therefore the man who changed the man who changed Hornsey. And his wife was Sophia, so she's the wife of the man who changed the man who changed Hornsey. If you're still with me. Sophia gave birth to nine children, but sadly James went bankrupt in 1872 and then suffered severe mental problems and was sent to Coney Hatch Asylum. That building's still there. It was known as Fryan Hospital for a while before being converted into flats. But he died in there back in 1882. By 1901, James's widow, 64-year-old Sophia Jane Reed, was living alone in Ferriston Road at number one. The missionary's wife, who is, whose son apparently died twice. Okay, Charles Jukes had been a Protestant miss, missionary, and this is him in Madagascar. According to the caption, which you might just be able to read at the bottom, he's waiting for the canoes. That's Charles there. This photo was taken around the same time um, so that he doesn't have to get his shoes dirty. Mr. Jukes is here being carried by local people with bare feet. Um, and the, the caption on this one says, Mr. Jukes on the way. Um, his wife, Emma Jukes, had four sons with Charles, all of them born in Madagascar, all of them successful in life. Um, but the youngest, Arger Arthur Dodgson Jukes, well, he seems to have died twice. Um, note the un unusual spelling of his name, Dodgson. Can't be two of them. Um, he seemed to die in Hampshire in 1955. This is from the National Probate Register. And according to this, according to this index of, of deaths, he died again in South Africa 10 years later. And that one's totally unexplained, I'm afraid. Anyway, in 1901, shortly after Charles died, Emma Jukes was living in Ferriston Road with one female servant at number three. Now to Ferriston Road's most famous house. This one made news all over the, all over the world. In January 1921, Mr. Isaac Sidney Frost brought in some coal and he claimed that some of it seemed to explode, not just in the fire, but in the buckets too. And some hopped out and sauntered along the floor. What did he do? He called the police. And in no time, newspapers were running lots of popular stories about why, what they called the Hornsey Coal, Hornsey Coal Poltergeist. So the stories are mostly based on what some members of the family had said had happened. I, that's the you know, coal passed through walls, damaged furniture and so on. While a Daily Mail journalist was in the house talking to two of the adults, loud noises were heard from another room where the grandchildren and their aunt Fanny were sitting. There was a breadboard and bread knife on the floor and the bread was in a nearby drawer. It was explained to the journalist that they'd gone there by themselves, but the journalist wasn't impressed. Later news stories included reports of an orange jumping from a chair and landing on a child's head, shoes jumping all around a bed, and, and cheese mysteriously moving from the kitchen table to the kitchen floor. Um, it's perhaps notable that one of the children, Gordon, always seemed to be there when these things happened. And you can find plenty of references to the Hornsey Coal Poltergeist online. And um, it's an, if you search for that, you won't find anything other than the Hornsey Coal Poltergeist. And I've also written at great length about it in that uh, Hornsey Historical Society bulletin. So I'll carry on at this point, apart from to show you this man, Charles Fort. It's from his name, Charles Fort, that the popular weird news magazine, 14 Times, took its name. And he wrote in his book, Wild Talents, that no poltergeist case had been investigated as completely as the Hornsey Coal Poltergeist. So if you're getting the feeling I don't believe in poltergeist, you could be right, but I'll leave that up to you. What is certain is that the house where these things were reported to have happened was number eight, as the internet will tell you. Now the prisoner of war, Hugh Shannon had been, had been a planter in Malaysia, probably, <clears throat> he'd been probably growing rubber. And during his life, he'd frequently traveled between London and Malaysia, sometimes with his wife, and child. <clears throat> but in the Second World War, as a lieutenant in the Royal Army Ordnance Corps, he sadly ended up in Chung Kai, a Japanese prisoner of war camp in Thailand. 
This is a photograph of the cast of an in-camp theatre production, and it looks okay here, but as you might imagine, the, the camp was in fact very horrible. <clears throat> the prisoners worked on construction of the Thai Burma Railway, which is famously depicted in the film The Bridge on the River Kwai. Lieutenant Hugh Shannon may have been one of the 13,000 prisoners who died in the process of building that. We know he died there in 1944. But back in the 1911 census, he's seen as a young telegraphic student lodging with a family called Eborn in Ferriston Road at number 10. <clears throat> Last one, a man who was objected to. So in 1885, before Ferriston Road existed, a, a wine merchant called Francis Tibbetts appeared on a list of persons objected to as ownership voters. <clears throat> in those days, if you owned property, you appeared on a list of voters and, and you were allowed to vote. Now here's a close up of the wording on the front page of that list. Um, persons have been objected to as not being entitled to have their names retained in the list. And here's Francis Tibbetts on page two. He was listed for three leasehold properties in New Southgate. It's not clear what the objection was nor who made it, but he did appear on the list of voters in later years. <clears throat> He generally seems to have struggled for status because in 1892 he was excluded from the Southgate Freemasons for non-payment. Not surprising really because he'd actually gone bankrupt the previous year. He had a lot of mouths to feed though. Francis had married Emily Van Scalina back in 1876 and they had three children together. And when Emily died in 1882 he very quickly married Emily's sister Marion Van Scalina who had five more children by him. Um, by 1911, Francis Tibbetts and his second wife, Marion, now called Marion Tibbetts, were living in Ferriston Road with four of their children and another Van Scalina sister, Henrietta Van Scalina. Uh, maybe her, Henrietta was there in case anything happened to Marion. Anyway, Francis T Tibbetts and the Van Scalina sisters lived at number five. Well, that's it, but there's just one more thing I want to squeeze in. It's, a, it's an amusing description of the builder of Ferriston Road, uh, William Bysouth. These words belong to the Reverend W.T. Stubbs uh, from a village called Reed in Hertfordshire, where Bysouth had previously lived. And they're not kind words. The greater part of the, the, greater part of the Bysouth clan lived at Reed, where they swarmed. The most prominent member was William. He had made a small fortune on jerry building in Tottenham and in his own opinion was a person of considerable importance. He farmed some of the glebe and was fond of saying when he paid over his cheque, that's a signature that's well known at the Bank of England. Probably the signing of his name was about the limit of his writing ability, he being uneducated and ignorant. He was instrumental in the erection of the Reed School, an enterprise which I always was against. By South pushed until he got it built and always used to speak of it as if it were his own possession. I never had a real row with him, though at times I got somewhere near it at managers meetings. His brother Dick, known familiarly as Dirty Dick, always maintained that his brother was never any good. Mrs. By South was rather an old horror. She was a keen dissenter, like her husband, and on the same level of intellect and refinement. Uncharitable people spoke of her as a canting old humbug. Once or twice she gave me tea, but she didn't really approve of me. I remember once I had written a placatory article in the parish magazine speaking of a possible reunion in an ideal future of church and dissent and referring to our common Lord and Master. This angered and shocked Mrs. Byself. She proclaimed that she had known Jesus was a poor man, but had never before heard of him spoken of as common and she disapproved strongly of such insulting language. She died and was buried in the yard. Bysouth insisted on having full and complete services for, both, for her, both in church and chapel on the same afternoon. That's it, thank you very much.